Welcome everyone to our final episode of Unconventional, which is a limited series that we're hosting here at the Justice Action Network, all about how bipartisan criminal justice re reform is playing a role in this election cycle. My name is Holly Harris and I'm executive director and president of the Justice Action Network. And we're honored today to have with us Representative Kelly Armstrong from North Dakota. Welcome, Representative Armstrong. It's great to have you. Well, thanks for having me. I love this subject and uh, you and I have talked before on it, so I'm really excited to be here. So I, I was just noting to you a little bit earlier, earlier and apologize, I apologize for outing your age, but you and I were actually born in the same year, 1976. Um, we both spent time at our state Republican parties. We both spent time at the state legislature and we've both been able to see the evolution of criminal justice reform, you know, not just as a sound policy, but as a really viable political issue. We now see candidates you know, like President Trump and, and Vice President uh, Biden uh, competing <laughs> uh, in a debate over who is stronger on criminal justice reform issues. And tell me what you've seen over the course uh, of your career. Well, sure. Well, and I think it's important for anybody watching to know prior to getting involved in government, I was actually a criminal defense attorney for 10 years. And when you do these types of things in North Dakota, uh, and that's what you specialize in, like I did everything from state court DUI defense and disorderly conduct to uh, large historical methamphetamine conspiracies in federal court. In fact, we've, I, we're one of the few clients in North Dakota that has actually had DOJ authorize and then deauthorize the death penalty on one of our clients. So I grew up with this as an issue way before I got involved in politics. And even prior to that, my grandmother was the head of North Dakota mental health for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I li literally grew up with addiction, mental health, mental, I mean, and having probably, I would say, I think it's fair to say a very different viewpoint on this than most Republicans had historically. And I think that's what I'm the most proud of, whether it's at the state level or the federal level is the Republican engagement in this issue uh, particularly because nobody's ever lost an election being tough on crime. And we have seen that. And the bipartisan failures of the last 40 years aren't even, I mean, we just know more now. We know more about brain development. We know more about addiction. And we know that regardless of how you feel about an offender, eventually they're going to end up back in society. And so how we deal with that becomes really, really important. So your time as a criminal defense attorney obviously shaped um, you know, a lot of your views on criminal justice reform, but, you know, also your time at the state legislature during your time there, um, North Dakota passed some really broad criminal justice reforms. You know, sometimes at Justice Action Network, we have a difficult time sort of bridging the divide between members of Congress and what's happening in their own backyards, because states have really been the drivers of criminal justice reform policy as our laboratories of democracy, and you were a part of that you know, big evolution in North Dakota. Tell us about uh, your time at the legislature and what you all did there. Well, so first it started when I first got elected and sometimes you just end up in the right circumstances. And we had had a couple really significant, I mean, just really bad deaths related to DUIs. And for those of you that don't know, I mean, we had no public transportation in North Dakota. It's a work hard, play hard state. Um, so it started with significant reform to our DUI law. And what had happened is a whole bunch of people who had written it had obviously not ever practiced it. And that's not a criticism to them, but they had dealt with it only in the criminal statute and not in the driving statute. And it was really, really an absolute mess. And I had actually asked our Senate Majority Leader at the time, I said, listen, you got to turn this into a study and we have to go back and talk to the DOT and different people and get this right. And he looked at me and said, Kelly, there is a mangled car that a six-year-old girl died in on the front steps of the Capitol. We're passing DUI reform, so go fix it. And so I spent three, we don't have offices in the state legislature. So I sat at my desk for essentially three nights in a row going through rewriting all of this to make sure the corresponding statutes were there, um, which gave me credibility with a lot of other members of the legislature to get it right. Um, but the one thing I would say that we did with the DUI reform, we enhanced the criminal penalties, particularly for second and subsequent offenses. But in North Dakota, 
without public transportation, if you're suspending driver's licenses, you're causing more problems than you saw. So we implemented what was called the, tw and for a second offense DUI, you lost your license for a year with no work permit. So we implemented what was called the 24 seven program because we don't care if offenders are driving, we care if they're drinking and driving. And this required them to stay sober for the course of the 24 seven, but then we'd allow them to have their driver's license provided we could monitor them. And it was testing twice a day at a sheriff's office or putting a scram bracelet on. And it's been incredibly effective, not just in reducing recidivism, but also in maintaining the other things that are important to those lives. Because if, if you lose your job and you're sitting in your basement and you have two kids and all of that, you're not helping with the underlying or alcohol issue, you're, you're hurting it. So it, it, it was a really good program. And then, then since then, we have redone um, a lot of drug, uh, dr drug penalties, minimum mandatories. We did some bail reform. Um, we're starting now, I'm actually not there, but we're doing a pretrial program pilot in North Dakota that we actually first started talking about in 2015. And it was funding and it's based off the federal pretrial program. So North Dakota has really been a thought leader in how this works and how we reduce um, different criminal penalties. And one thing North Dakota has that's unique that I'd actually like to see is scaled up across the country is we allow for two years of supervised probation on a misdemeanor. And um, one thing that I'm really kind of I, I'm beating the drum on and hopefully I'll get more people involved is we gotta remember the vast majority of your first offense, nonviolent felonies, you don't spend any time in prison. What you do do is become a felon at 19 years old. Yeah. And if you're a felon at 19 years old, your life trajectory is just yeah. significantly changed. Mm -hmm. And so we created, we didn't reduce a ton of penalties or, uh, classifications, but we built misdemeanor trap doors into the drug code. So if you have a 19 year old kid who gets caught with his first time ever, and I don't care if it's meth, oxy, three pills of speed because he or she was trying to study for a chemistry exam, we allow for the prosecutors to reduce that felony to a misdemeanor and still keep them on probation for two years because that's what they really want, right? They want to make sure you're doing your treatment, you're not reoffending. And so that really creates an opportunity for not, particularly young offenders, young adult offenders to not be saddled with a felony right out of the gate. And I think probably long term in North Dakota, that'll have more positive consequences than anything else we did. Because your likelihood of being a repeat, I mean, once you have one felony, the second, third and fourth don't matter nearly as much. So by reducing the felonization rates, I think we really are going to get the most ROI, particularly with young offenders. So we did a ton of that stuff in North Dakota. Yeah, you had a lot of success um, while in the state legislature on this issue. And then you transitioned to Congress, a little slower pace in Congress. Um, but uh, in your first year, you filed, I mean, you've been very successful at working across the aisle um, and you filed a lot of legislation. Um, so tell us about, I mean, you had mentioned that your mother was a, a leader in mental health. Um, and, and I know uh, there's a piece of legislation that you're working on um, with folks across the aisle, like Representative Trone, um, you know, that impacts uh, mental health and how folks in custody and upon reentry are treated um, when they have mental health issues. Yeah, I mean, so I, first of all, addiction's a disease, but it's the only disease you can get yelled at for having. I think that's an old George Carlin joke. Um, and every family, I, it's impossible to have a situation where you weren't touched by, or so, a family isn't touched by addiction, whether it's drugs or alcohol. And I mean, I, in a lot, I'm not, I mean, I have an undergraduate psychology degree, so I'm just smart enough to be dangerous on this stuff. But I do know this, whether it's the chicken or the egg, you cannot detach addiction from mental health. Um, depression, I mean, just all kinds of different different um, things of that. So I've worked, uh, I mean, there's a couple ones that we're uh, proud of that we've got across the finish line. Um, one, I, I mean, which was started by Senator Heitkamp and others before I got there was Savannah's Act. Uh, this is one to track missing, missing, missing Native women and uh, helping the federal government have a different database. I worked with Rep Scanlon on a juvenile justice bill that passed right before we left, at least through the house, which will allow juvenile offenders who are, who are sentenced in adult, in adult prisons to not have to go through as many of the procedural hurdles they do before they can file some of their different um, relief actions, which I think is, it's a small thing, but it's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Trone and I just introduced a pretrial bill 
uh, which is essentially giving grant. And I think how I look at this, I'll just sidetrack. 2 million out of 2.3 million people incarcerated in this country are state, local prisons and jails. So when you're doing things from the federal government, you have to really figure out ways to incentivize local municipalities to do those things. Mm -hmm. And so this one is essentially, I mean, helping them reduce recidivism or reduce incarceration pretrial. I know in North Dakota during the oil boom, it was somewhat, depending on where you were at, it was between 75 and 95% of all the people incarcerated in local jails were pretrial. They were incarcerated before they went to trial. And a lot of it had to do with couldn't afford a $500 bond or didn't have substantial ties to the community. Well, that's a tremendous drain on resources. It's its own unique trial penalty because if you have to sit in trial or sit in jail for nine months for something you're never gonna spend any time in prison for, your incentive to plead guilty to whatever is put in front of you is just significantly higher. And it's the one thing the federal government does really well. Their pretrial services are fantastic. Um, it's non-adversarial, it's non-confrontational. Uh, your pretrial services gets you into treatment, helps you with job skills, life skills. It's really, at least in North Dakota, it was, it was a really great program to work with. The great irony is then you walk into court on a 10-year min man and you're going to spend eight and a half years in a federal pen. And I don't care how good your pretrial services are, you're probably not going to remember all of those tools eight and a half years later. But so we modeled this program off of that. And it has the benefit of getting these people out, getting them treatment. You know, if you're married or have a family, you still get to involve in that. You can keep your keep your employment. But it also has another benefit. And, and this is the one that I really found. In conservative states like North Dakota, prosecutors and judges are more apt to cut you a break if there's a carrot and a stick. Mm -hmm. And if you get somebody out on pretrial, and they go to all their treatment, they maintain their job, they haven't drank or used in six months while they're waiting up for their pretrial, you're much, like, much more likely to get a lesser prison sentence or get a reduction in the charges, but the prosecutors and the judges like it because you still have the stick. So if you get out and you test hot seven times, you're probably not gonna get that benefit anymore. And what I found with my clients is when they absolutely know that the benefit um, to them could be years in prison, They'll do the work. And, and, if, and again, anybody who's dealt with addiction, we don't care why they go to treatment. We just care that they're there, right? And we, we don't care why they're staying sober. We just care that they're sober and continue to work with that. So it's been, it, I'm glad that program's um, out. We've been very, very conscious to make sure it's not a, I mean, bond is set on danger to the community and likelihood of appearance at trial. And we just simply have way too many people across this country sitting in pretrial detention because they can't afford 500 bucks. Not because they're a danger to the community or not because they're gonna flee, but simply because they're in a financial situation that doesn't allow it. Um, New Jersey's done a good job with this. It started with Governor Christie and it's moved into it. So it's been bipartisan, but also have to recognize that if you move this pendulum too far too fast, more so than any other issue, you're one headline away from the pendulum swinging all the way back. So I, I always caution my friends who are really pro-criminal justice reform to make sure you're doing it in, at a pace that your community, whatever that is, is, is going to accept. And it's why when I was in North Dakota, I stayed away from violent crimes, stayed away from sex offense crimes, and particularly concentrated on addiction-related crimes. Not because I don't necessarily think there needs to be reform across the system, but I mean, I'm just telling you, there's no pro sex offender constituency in North Dakota. It doesn't exist. So you exert all your political capital for a minor win and run the risk of having one of those really, really bad headlines that, that negates all the work you've been doing for three years. So you seem to have navigated the waters pretty well in Congress for being there just a year. Um, and you, know, you figured out how to govern in the minority. And if the polls are right, uh, there may be um, a lot of your colleagues who are going to find themselves in that position for the very first time. What advice do you give to lawmakers who suddenly find themselves in the minority, you know, without the power and without the control? You know, how do you get in there and ensure that your voice is heard and that your legislation can move? Go be a criminal defense attorney for 10 years. I was used to fighting and losing. Uh, it was just kind of part of the game. Uh, no, make, I, so, but I, I really mean that. So I practice criminal defense in small towns all across North Dakota. 
And if you hated every prosecutor you dealt with, if you fought with every law enforcement department you were practicing with, and you got mad at the judges all the time, it's a pretty lonely existence. So I made it a point to keep things professional. I mean, I won a lot more cases than a lot of other lawyers around here, but I also ended up having a, a burger and a beer with the cop who testified in the trial that day at five o'clock at night and talking about it. And I got great, I mean, I got great stories about that. But this issue is great. I mean, even, even in the highly polarized version in which um, social justice and criminal justice reform came about in this last Congress, you know, talking to Karen Bass, Sheila Jackson Lee, Hakeem Jeffries, um, I've said this before, you know, the white freshman congressman from a, a state that's almost 90% white doesn't seem like the guy who would understand a lot of these issues, but I've picked minority juries before with minority clients. I've never had a minority in a jury pool in North Dakota, not on a jury, in a jury pool. Wow. And whether it was off Native American reservations or offenders in local communities. So I'm probably a little different than a lot of my Republican colleagues. Systemic racial disparities exist in law enforcement and recognizing that's the first step to dealing with it. Now, I, I push back on my Democratic colleagues because I don't like the term systemic racism because racism is an inherently human thing. And when you call it systemic racism, you're taking the human culpability out of it. And the reason we have systemic racial disparities a lot of times is, is neutral on its face. Pretrial release. Um, man, minimum mandatory sentences because of prior drug, drug convictions, uh, enhancements in school zones. Those are three places where I can just absolutely show you the data supports that there are racial disparities. Um, and we can, I mean, we can walk through them. Pretrial release is often based on, is based on economics as much as anything. Um, minimum mandatory sentences are, it's just much more likely that a minority offender gets, gets a suspended sentence versus a dismissal on a minor marijuana charge. I mean, that's just, that's just the reality of the way it works. Part of that's because it's overworked public defenders, different discrepancies, all of that. And school zones just is a, is a nature of how we've continued to enhance and expand those because it's easy pickings for local, po local politicians to be tough on crime. But if you look, particularly in urban areas where those school zones overlap, well, most of your high density, low income population lives within a school zone. And school zones were originally designed to make sure we weren't selling drugs to fourth graders, which is a noble goal. And if you are selling drugs to fourth graders, I don't have a problem with you getting a minimum mandatory sentence. But if you look, live in a low income high rise apartment and you're buying drugs from your drug dealer who lives three apartments away from you, that's still a crime. But what is the fact that you're six blocks away from an elementary school have to do with that crime? That enhancement isn't appropriate in that scenario. And so, oh, by the way, we redid that in North Dakota too, which I was probably really proud of. So we need to look at these things and look at where we come together. And I, I think one of the things that I've learned is understand that in highly toxic political environments, nothing's gonna move. I mean, we knew this, right? They weren't taking any amendments in the House Judiciary from Republicans, whether they like the amendment or not. They weren't gonna allow Tim Scott's bill to get a vote on the floor of the Senate, whether they, whether they liked it or not. We just knew this. So, but what you do do is create the relationships for after everything calms down and you can go back to all the really smart people on both sides of the aisle that actually care about this issue and you have a framework and you have a relationship built up. So you brought up systemic racism and then now you've brought up Tim Scott's bill, which opens up, um, you know, another topic um, and an issue where we haven't seen as much bipartisan support and that's on policing reform. Um, you know, you, you had the, the House version of policing reform, you, you had Tim Scott's bill in the Senate. As you mentioned, there was really, um, you know, nothing really to bridge the divide there. Um, Post-election, um, right now we find ourselves, you know, perhaps in the most acidic political climate in modern history. Post-election, um, you know, these issues are still going to be there yep. and these problems are still going to exist. Um, how are you going to be a part of bringing both sides together to work on policing reform, which again is an issue where we simply have not seen the same bipartisan, bipartisan consensus as we've seen on the other issues that you've worked on, like sentencing reform, probation and parole, and bail reform. Well, I, I, and I would ask this question to you too. I mean, I think what, we have the framework, right? Because it was the First Step Act. And that was getting more Republicans comfortable with that than you could possibly think was possible. 
But I think one of the fundamental problems, which I've noticed in Congress as a whole that we're going to have to deal with, is it seems like my colleagues on the other side of the aisle over the first two, two years just want this huge, all-encompassing, you know, I say throw the baby out with the bathwater, like substantial, massive piece of legislation. And I would argue with them that targeted specific legislation where you can get bipartisan support makes a lot of sense. And so we'll see, right? We all believe more de-escalation training for law enforcement is great. It doesn't matter if you're in a rural area or an urban area. We all understand that qualified immunity probably needs to be looked at. Where we get into differentiates is if you, I mean, we neglect the fact that, um, and I use, I use this, this isn't so much for me a racial issue. It's a rural law enforcement versus urban law enforcement issue. And what I mean, and what I mean by that is if you get rid of qualified immunity, you get rid of small de police departments. That's just what happens. Because if you have a department of five or six people, the city or the municipality is going to cover that insurance. They have a hard enough hire, they have a hard enough hiring times and beat getting people to apply for jobs in Beach, North Dakota, as it is. If you tell them they're going to have to carry their own liability insurance, good luck getting anybody to apply for those jobs. So what's going to happen is you're going to have municipalities picking up that insurance tab. Well, because all excessive force cases are a civil rights violation, right? Every single one. Doesn't matter what the race of the offender is. Doesn't matter what the race of the cop is. Any, any excessive force case is a civil rights violation. That's the first step. The second step is everyone is a question of fact, which means they all go to jury. If they get pushed long enough, it's very hard to get these cases dismissed pre-trial. So if you don't have some form of this, you're going to create a sue and settle atmosphere. And trust me, these are my very good friends, but most of my friends who are criminal defense attorneys also do plaintiff's work. And I can just tell you, so then what happens is the insurance, the insurance company for the municipality settles a case, then they settle a second case. Then the municipalities rates go up so high that they disband their police force and turn it over to the county. And that's the reality of what we're dealing with. So we have to figure out how we address these issues. And listen, nobody, I, you're not going to get any argument from me that the way qualified immunity is currently applied is absolutely ridiculous. But it's judge made law and we can go in and we can focus it without getting rid of it. But there are all Mr. kinds Dufresne of issues. from Indiana had a really interesting bill um, related to qualified immunity reform. Were you able to review that legislation? Yes. And that's the best piece that I have seen yet that's actually attacking the issues and still allowing, you know, at the end of the day, we don't want cops not to get out of the car. And I mean, the one thing I mean, and recognizing for all the things we talk about with police reform. It's the only job I know of that every time you get out of the car, you are you run the risk of being in significant danger. I mean, that's just the reality of law enforcement, at least for law enforcement officers. When they get out of the car, they don't take their family and their futures with them. And so I think Senator Braun's on to something. I think um, we just have to be very, very careful that we what we are doing is getting rid of the bad actors and not making it difficult for the good ones. And um you know, there's a, you even saw it in the hearing. I mean, if you talk about organized labor and how, I mean, just the way, it, I mean, they're not, they're willing to have this conversation, you know, on, and this is important in North Dakota too. If you have three um, hits on your jacket in Baltimore and they're all sealed through collective bargaining or negotiated settlement and you apply for a job in Dickinson, North Dakota, and we don't have access to that, it's going to be a problem in my hometown too. So making sure that we making sure that we have a way to track. Um, but see, this is a discrepancy between Democrats and Republicans that I think will fix. They want all the hits on the jacket. And I can just tell you, I've been I've had a lot of my clients file excessive force cases, cases against cops. And with the exception of two of them, most of my clients were way out of line, too. Right. I mean, we want the ones that stick, not the ones that are accused. Because, I mean, that, and once we get that framework in place, I'm confident we'll get something set up. You had asked me about, um, you said you pose a question to me about, you know, how to get, uh, you know, the right and the left together um, on policing reform. One of our, probably our most significant um, tactic um, that we used when we were trying to move first step is we pivoted from the Senate to the House um, because we did feel like we could get 
It wasn't the strongest bill, you know, um, it was uh, the Jeffries Collins prison reform bill initially that didn't have the sentencing reforms that were added later on the Senate side. Um, but, you know, Representative Bass has said to me, you know, we, we really need to get a bipartisan vehicle in the House that we can then present to the Senate. So, um, you know, you've mentioned, you know, your willingness to, to work across the aisle. Um, you know, who among your colleagues, your Republican colleagues, are we overlooking um, that we should be reaching out to that you think would be, you know, willing to work across the aisle? We've talked to, we're good friends with Representative Guy Reschenthaler. Obviously, you know, we're close to Representative Doug Collins. You know, who among your colleagues should we be reaching out to that you think really has a desire and, and the capacity to work on bipartisan criminal justice reform? Um, I think Pete Stauber is a good guy. Um, one, because he's former law enforcement, really, really buys into um, community policing. And more importantly, if you don't win over that pro-law enforcement side of the Republican Party, I don't think your problem is going to be in the House. I mean, look, this is the most marijuana reform uh, House of Representatives we've ever had on both sides of the aisle, whether it's the States Act, the SAFE Act, um, all of those different things. But I think you hit it kind of in a different way. I mean, sometimes the enemy is the Senate, and that's not always partisan, right? I mean, Senator Heitkamp, when she represented North Dakota as a former attorney general and is of the political generation above me that, you know, nobody's ever lost an election being tough on crime. I mean, and, and so there's some issues there. But I think the real, the real issue is going to be, at, at least in the current makeup, is who in that Judiciary Committee is going to work either with, no offense, but the toxic leadership. I mean, are the partisan leadership, right? It's very, I mean, Karen Bass and I got the real opportunity to get to know each other during the course of these conversations. Sheila Jackson Lee and I got the course, the chance to know each other through the course of these conversations. Um, there are people on both sides, uh, guys like Ben Klein, who, you know, really, I mean, Chip Roy, I mean, you're, you're, you, the, 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 yes, they're in the Freedom Caucus, but they also have strong libertarian bents and they've both practiced law in the criminal spectrum. So they understand where there are places we can move. And then I think the real, the other real issue where you'll always get pushed back from me is making sure that in our quest to reform policing in downtown Minneapolis, we don't put somebody on the rural highway in Northwest North Dakota in danger. Cause we, we measure back up in hours, not minutes sometimes. And it's just a very different way to do this. And then the other thing is, is I think we have to recognize every state's enforcement capacity over law enforcement is a little different. So not, not mandating, that, mandating that things get accomplished or incentivizing the things that get accomplished are great, but make sure each state can incorporate them into their current framework. I mean, requiring a citizen review board of every police department in North Dakota makes no sense. All of our stuff goes to the post board at the state level. We're just a small state and we have very few um, departments that are big enough to deal with this. So making sure that states can, can, can do it with the resources they have, not with the resources we wish they had is really important. So you mentioned, you know, the House has uh, partisan leadership, the Senate in fairness, and I'm sitting here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Mitch McConnell's backyard, um, and the Senate has very partisan leadership as well. Um, but I noticed um, very recently when Leader McConnell was making the case for um, preserving uh, the Republican Senate majority, there were three issues that he raised. Um, the Supreme Court, tax reform, and bipartisan criminal justice reform, which was a special moment for me because then at that moment, I knew the Godfather saw the political viability of bipartisan criminal justice reform. Um, I mentioned we're the mo in the most you know, toxic political environment in, in probably in, in our time in politics. Um, do you see uh, opportunity for us to work together post-election and how quickly do you think we'll be able to move forward? Um, I, yes, I do. And I, I mean, I gotta give a lot of credit to David Trone um, I mean, he came in, I mean, and he doesn't have a background in this professionally, right? He's a businessman, he's whatever, but he had a close family member die of, a day of overdose. And so he has made this part of it his, I mean, just like really, really worked hard at it. And I, I like, I'm the Republican co-chair of the bipartisan working group, uh, freshman group on addiction. 
But I hesitate to even say that because he literally does 85% of the work. Now I'm dealing with other issues in judiciary that always factor into this, but I think that's where the opportunity really, really, really lies. We've got way, we've got a lot of service veterans and veterans uh, and veterans in both sides, anybody who served, anybody who has, um, I mean, colleagues that have served, you run into this addiction issue when you get out. And I mean, not for, I mean, it's just the, the rates are higher and there's just a lot of people that are willing to work with it. And the reality is, is you can't work on opioid addiction reform without talking about criminal justice reform because they just go hand in hand. And I think actually in these really part, part, partisan areas, when we find opportunities where we actually all agree, I think that's people, there are people striving to govern I mean, there really are, especially if you get out of that and whether it's whether it's uh, I mean, we saw a little bit of this in the antitrust subcommittee. I mean, we will fight on what the solutions are, but it was a really bipartisan investigation where we worked very well with both sides of the aisle. And I, I mean, it's just I mean, you can go down, you know, the people involved in the First Step Act, they haven't gone away. Yeah. I mean, they just haven't. Uh, when we were doing FISA reauthorization, my best ally was Zolofgren. <laughs> I mean, it, these things aren't always that partisan. I think the answer is, is, and, th and I'm as guilty as this as anybody. I could talk about every different aspect of this, and it can get almost so big it's overwhelming. Find the targeted areas where we really agree that we can make, that we can, we, we can do something and make a substantial difference, and then do it. And then I also think there's the opportunity because I, I, I just, I, I, as a member of the state legislature and now as a member of Congress, we are gonna make so much more progress so much more quickly in the laboratories of democracy, which are state legislatures than we really are at the congressional level. Some of that's a function of our dysfunction. Some of it's a function of how most law enforcement is conducted. Um, our job really will be to target grant money and get it where it needs to go. but. If, if Cedric wants to go on the road and go meet with state legislators, I am in. I'll road trip with that guy anywhere. He can tell me old baseball stories. I can tell him old criminal justice, criminal defense attorney war stories. And we'll go out and start promoting this stuff. And because there's, there's an appetite for it. People really want to do this better. Well, Representative Armstrong, we're going to leave it there. Really appreciate the hopeful um, discussion here. We look forward to all of your accomplishments. Thank you for everything that you've done in North Dakota. Um, we look forward to everything you're gonna do at the federal level. And the first call we're gonna make is to Representative Trone's office and tell him all the nice things you said about him on this, uh, this the last episode of Unconventional. So thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you all for having me and thanks for everything you do. This has not always been the best, the easiest subject to advocate for, but if you all wouldn't have been there, we wouldn't be here now. So thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Representative Armstrong. And again, we look forward to working with Representative Armstrong and his colleagues on the right side of the dial and on the left side of the aisle on criminal justice reform, uh, policing reform. And, and really, uh, uh, if there's any other subjects you, you all would like to cover in a bipartisan way, I think the, the country is really hungry for it. So thank you again for your leadership. Thank you.